If it's Aussie and it rocks, it's right here. This is Triple M's Homegrown with Matty O. Yes, right around the country on the Triple M Network, 52 stations and on the brand new listener app. This is a big moment for the show. I was lucky enough to see this artist on Burke Street in Melbourne enjoying a coffee as they bust. And how I felt then is how millions of people around the world feel right now watching, mesmerised. It's incredible musicianship, makes it look so easy, multi-instrumentalist. It's almost an extension of themselves, self-taught at just three years old. It's raw emotion, talent, singer, songwriter, producer, also help nurturing the next generation of artists in this country, which is so important. Lonely Lands Booking Agency, collaborating and mentoring such acts as Ocean Alley, Tones and I, propelling them onto the world stage, and they're just getting started. Of course, I'm talking about... Tash Sultana, what a body of work. So many hits. Makes it seem easy. Tracks like Free Mind, you love Sweet and Dandy. Collaborating too. And everyone here at Triple M can vouch for me being obsessed with this song, but I just can't stop singing it. It is an absolute pleasure to welcome Tash Sultana to Triple M's Homegrown. Thank you so much Thank for coming you. in. Thank you. Those of you who are listening right now, yeah. you, you, you can't actually see, but I loved how you introed me just then and said um, that I've been self-taught. Uh, since I was three, but you actually only held up two fingers. Self-taught at just three years old. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> For those watching on YouTube, you can go and find this interview <laughs> now. You always get it just so right. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, no, I loved it. Um, yeah. Hey, looking back on, um, you know, that like that body of work and, you know, I, t- I touched on the busking. Does it, does it feel like yesterday? Does it feel like a lifetime um, ago? I was literally talking about this. In the car on the way here, yeah, I was talking about, just, we were driving down Sydney Road and I was just, you know, all those venues that I used to play in yeah. and I still go to them to have dinner or watch another artist or, mm. you know, have a chill. Yeah. You know, we, I still frequent all the places that I began yeah. in. So the Cornish Arms is, is one of them. So on a Monday night back you know, late 2000s, yeah. I used to play there and and do the open mic night. Yep. And that was really like where I kind of started finding my way. And then from there I was like, okay, well, what other open mic nights are around? What, what can I do? And mm. I went on the internet and just Googled open mic nights, Victoria, and just yeah. wrote a list of the, all of them down, what was what was available to me from Monday through to Sunday. That's so cool. And I literally did them all. That's where I started really getting in front of people and just, and I was shit. I don't I, I, No, I no, that. I was honestly <laughs> so shit. Like I was That's actually, what everyone says. No, but I was <laughs> actually pretty shit. Um, you do get better if you continue to like work on it. It's anyway, I was, you know, I was a kid back then. Well I'm still a kid now. But we also on our journey here to the radio station, um, drove past the Drunken Poet, which is a little Irish Oh, did you play there? That was my first ever p- paid gig. Wow. Do they know that? Because I reckon they'd put up a statue if they did. They, <laughs> oh, look, we've, we've looked after each other through the years, so yeah, they nice. lost their like live music license and I helped them get it back. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, that's great. I don't yeah. think a lot of people know that, so that's good to hear. Yeah. No, I was kind of just like I had the owner call me and she was just like, you know, I, I don't really want to ask for a favour. Yeah. As the Irish generally don't. <laughs> yeah. Um and I just thought, you know what? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm absolutely going to give That's you awesome. a reference letter here because I shouldn't have even been allowed in the doors of the pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. like, smoking and drinking. <laughs> yeah. And fucking breaking guitar strings. Yeah. And at, like, you know, 15, 16 years old. Yeah. And I still remember I got 75 bucks for a one-hour gig. That's pretty good. Gig, and back then it was just like, whoa. What are we doing? How many bags of weed can I buy with this? You I was, was going to say, could you duck across to the night markets across the road? Shout out to everyone. It's in <laughs> Melbourne. It's an Irish bar just across the Queen Vic markets. Yeah, go, go and say Have hello to... 
to Siobhan from Tash Sultana. She'll love that. Oh, she absolutely will. And I think, like, when I think back to those days, but I always found you, like, really personable. Like, I, even if I was walking past you, you'd always be talking to fans. And I dug this up and I thought this was really fascinating. It's kind of cool busking because sometimes people will give you gifts. It's just really, really nice. Everything that I get given on the street, I keep. Still got? I just want to just... <laughs> <laughs> My Disclaimer. voice is so much higher pitched. <laughs> How old is that? Uh, I think it's about six or seven years old on YouTube. It could be a bit older. I'm not too sure. But I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I played something not long ago from when I was 16 and it was like, Hi, I'm Tash Slater, and you're <laughs> listening to my son, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. uh, my, my wife was like, um, was that you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, fuck, I actually, like, for, in my mind, I've sounded exactly the same as this for my whole life. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the gifts on the street, I still do. There was a, there was this uh, uh, Chinese fella who used to come and, and watch me on this busking on the street and he yeah. gave me this, like, uh, jade um, pendant. Nice. And to this day, I still have that on my 12 string. Nice. And he used to come and I'd, I'd play... Blackbird, which is something oh, I right. still play now, and he'd clap his hands and he'd, he'd, he's like he was old then. He would have been about seventy five, and he'd just like get into it, clap his hands, throw his arms up, kick a fucking leg up in the air, <laughs> yeah. and just go nuts. Yeah, and, and he'd always come and do it. Like yeah. if I was playing and I saw him walking down the street, and we'd eyeball each other. It nice. was like, all right, I'm just going to quickly grab the twelve string. And <laughs> yeah. We know what's the go here. <laughs> Did you find that like um, performing to people in that kind of environment, whether they just be they're on a break or they're seeing Melbourne for the first time, it was a real good way for people to kind of reset and switch off for like just a brief moment when they were watching you. Maybe it was the same for you. Like you felt like a moment of solitude where you're setting up and, you know, everyone's kind of moving around you. And then, you know, once you play the first chord, then that's when it starts. Well, it kind of went a little bit like this. Um, I'll give you the backstory. Is I had um, I was already doing a lot of shows and everything before I ever even got onto the street busking. So that's something that people always kind of misinterpret is that I I started out busking, but I actually mm. didn't. I started out doing open mic nights, and before that, I was in a band, and and anyway, that history started much earlier. Yeah. But when I finished high school in uh, 2013, 10 years this year. Hey. Yeah. Going to the reunion? Um, you should go. It's uh, fun. I didn't it's even. Fun. T- I you should, even I'm telling you, you don't think it's going to be fun, but it's fun. I didn't even go to my graduation, actually. Well, maybe give it a miss. Yeah. And I, my, the last day I ever spent at school was muck up day. And I got asked to leave because <laughs> I had dressed up as something really inappropriate, okay. which I'm not going to say. Don't have to. It's all good. What it is. But yep. anyway, <laughs> God, I, those that were at Essendon Keeler College in 2013 <laughs> will know exactly what I'm talking about. If Shout out. Right now. <laughs> yeah. But. I finished school and my mum was like, well, <laughs> you got to get a job. Yeah. And so I was like, but I, I've got one, yeah. you know, and yeah. she was just like, you know, 25 bucks a week or 50 bucks a week is not going <laughs> to fucking cut it. <laughs> yeah. And she didn't know, you know, what I was doing on the side, which maybe I shouldn't say. No, that's right. I wasn't prostituting. No, no, it's a late it night green show. It's and you cut it up and you sell it in little small bags and it's kind of like a herb. Zucchini. Zucchini. Lettuce. <laughs> lettuce. Dill. I was selling bags of lettuce. Coriander. Dill out the window of my parents' <laughs> front room, my own bedroom. But so on my 18th birthday, my dad took me to a music store and that was like something that we always did together. And he said, you can pick something for your 18th birthday. And that's kind of the last big present I'm going to get you because you're an adult. Yep. Blah, 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 blah. So we go in there and I'm picking between a banjo and a loop station. It was an RC30 loop station. That's That was the beginning. And I, I put it on the counter and he said, you know, mm, I think you're making a massive mistake here. Should have got the banjo. Well, little did we know that (laughs) this little machine was going to revolutionise the way that I performed. So when I was busking, when I would play things acoustically, no one would stop. Like I just would not get the time of day. And then one day I just decided to whip out the electric guitar and kind of just loop some guitar and have a bit of a jam and stuff. Yeah. And that is what started to stop the street. Yeah. So then in my little brain, I was like, okay, this is the formula here. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's kind of where the looping stuff began. I don't use an RC30 anymore. We actually have like a 
hectic custom built machine. Nice. It's ridiculous. Nice. Um, so anyway, <laughs> but back then it was way more streamlined mm. and I just started adding to that. So I just started adding to that, uh, loop station with like a bunch of effects and the pedal board just kind of grew. And then I yeah. figured out back then you couldn't get multi-channel loop stations. So you only had stereo in, in, in and out. Yeah. And I was just like, finding ways how to connect like multiple nice. drum pads and yeah, yeah, run yeah. the bass through it and put a synthesizer in and, and all that. So mm. that's that's where it started. And then I started, I was playing gigs obviously this entire time and then people just like started rocking up yeah. and then, you know, I'd play a gig and it'd be 20 people, then it'd be 30, then it'd be 50, yeah. then it'd be 60 and then, you know, I started was playing some bigger shows and they were selling out and yeah. I had no airplay at this point. It's very much this like underground hidden yeah. thing yeah. that was kind of emerging in like 2013, 2014, 2015. Mm. But it, during that period of time, people were coming to the gigs and I'd recorded some stuff and no one really cared. And, you know, I was selling CDs for five bucks. Those were selling. Yeah, I was good. I was a good sales oh, yeah. Definitely. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I had no commercial play, but I was still selling out these shows on my own. And then I thought, you know what? I've not really got any visual performances. Yeah. So that's when I got the camera out yeah. and then the camera is when everything changed oh. because I had that little jungle clip up well and truly before it actually exploded online. Yeah. So I had a different version of it on an iPhone 4. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, no. No one gave a shit. But then down the line, a couple of years later, I got the camera out, a GoPro out, turned it black and white, put it up. And I don't know what it was, but it, it just took off. Well, it's what people were seeing every day. And that's why you were, you, you know, you were getting these huge crowds. It was just like everyone on the world, you know. It's just but then it became the world after that. You know, so, like when it was up on YouTube and stuff yeah, like that, exactly. it, it became the world. And I've been having these conversations at the moment with a few people. Um, every time you release new music, you've got people that will always go, I love it. I've been on the ride the whole time. You've progressed so much as an artist and, yeah. you know, so on and so forth. And you've got people that go, you know, I didn't really like your old stuff, but your new stuff is so much better better and, and then you've got the other people that as you know being an artist mm. will go nah yeah love your old your old stuff was good and all your new sh stuff's shit yeah. so that's kind of every time you release something you're gonna as an artist you have to expect that's gonna happen you do not have to tune in and listen to it because it's noise so what i do and have learned to do is that everything that you are creating needs to genuinely and truthfully come from the right place of you. Because yeah. if you're chasing something and you're trying to force it, yeah. it's not it's probably not going to happen. You know, yeah. I, I've given up on writing hits and I've given up on maybe, you know, getting a Grammy or another Aria yeah. or in the billboards or, you know. Yeah. Like I've, what I've, what I've realized is what I'm doing and what I have and who I am is enough. Yeah. It's enough. I love that. And it took a long time to get there. What a great story that's been as well. Like surrounding yourself with the right people. For those who don't know, uh, David and Ring run Lemon Tree, uh, one of the biggest management companies in the world. Uh, how cool is it to be on that journey together from start to now? Yeah. Well, with the Bonja boys, like they got fucked over so badly in the music industry that they just DIY'd it. Yeah. So like the drummer is now a lawyer. Yeah. And the singer is a videographer and a photographer and an amazing artist. Yeah. And he now works with all these other artists mm. um, on their journey. And like Dave and Riggs started a management company because yeah. they were just so fucked over most of their career. And and that's really where it started from. So back in the day, it was just the PBs that they looked after Yeah, and me. And I used to open, me and the Pierce brothers have known each other for a really long time since mm. I met Pat Pierce when I was 15 at uh, a thing called Songwriters in the Round. Um, nice. And it used to happen at the Wesley Ann and oh, cool. you'd get three artists and you'd all alternate playing a song for like, nice. I think it must have been about two hours or something like that. I like that. And anyway, he's also really good behind the camera. Yes. And that, that night he was there. 
Mm. And that's that's where we first met. That's so cool. And, yeah. I, and I love it how you talk about all these people doing other things as well. And that's what I like about you starting Lonely Lands as well. You've got this other kind of business where you can be creative in another space as well. Because if maybe, you know, you're a bit of a songwriting writer or whatever, you can go to this other thing that you've built as well. And you get to nurture other artists and support them and kind of give them that guidance that they might not have. Well, like, I think... I don't like the way that, I, for the most part, I really don't appreciate how the music industry has been run. And I would say it's definitely coming to a turning point. I think so for too. sure. It's a forced turning point, definitely. Mm. Um, it needs to be progressive. You know, it's not to say that the way that it was didn't work. Yeah. It's just that as a society, everything changes. And I don't even think people really need to have a record label or any of that shit anymore because of the internet. Like I was listening to the radio the other day and there was this dude who's got this massive song from fucking TikTok, Mm. right? Yeah. It's not looked after at all. It's just Mm. like this song exploded on the internet. Mm. said no label representation whatsoever and it's the biggest song in the world. So we are in what I think is the age of accessible DIY. So information is readily available to Mm. you to develop in your own way. And then there's a platform that you can just launch into the stratosphere, Yeah, which is also a really bad thing. But I always did things my own way because I felt like I didn't really fit in. And I still feel like that, but I don't care. Um, I'm kind of happy about it. Like even when I was a kid, like... I never belonged to a set group of people or a clique or anything like that. I was a bit of a drifter, you know. I was happy to kind of have a chat with everybody and I'm still like that now. Like my wife calls me have a chat because like (laughs) I'll just fucking talk. Oh, good. Well, wait, well, I've got the studio booked for another three hours. Yeah, we don't anyway, have to go anyway. like, this could go on forever today. <laughs> I, I hope um, it does. But I didn't appreciate how certain things are being run by thinking about the artist last. Mm. I think you can also have really good relationships with labels as well. Like you just, I think you need to realize that you do have the power to negotiate what's written on the page. So a lot of people just see a big flash of a sum of money in front of their eyes and they kind of think, you know, I'm never, I'm never ever going to see this kind of money again. Was That's not actually necessarily true at all. It's mm. about knowing what you want and for the love of God, get a damn lawyer. To look over it <laughs> totally, working. right? Like mistakes are so much more expensive. And they only than, have to be a couple yeah, of words, like, you know? you know, you, you just got to. Because these corporations, they eat shit and breathe this stuff. Yeah. But what I'm running for Lonely Lands, that's not a label. So that's an agency. Yeah. So we're an independent-based booking agency. and we Exactly. Book artist uh, gigs within Oz Pacific region. So yep. now we're starting to branch out into Asia and kind of set people up over there. Yeah, cool. We're doing stuff in New Zealand. We're having conversations with quite a few uh, international artists that are looking forward to having good. Australian representation in this section of the world. That's so cool. Because there's a bit of, a, you know, you know, it's, they're keen on it. There's, yeah, a, yeah, there's yeah. a movement happening in Australia that a lot of people want to be a part of. And Australia, I think for the first time, is properly being shown to the world of what kind of artistry that we have here. Because I feel like things have been very, like, Americanized for yeah. a long time. We, we all know what the fuck's going on in America. Mm. America doesn't necessarily know what the fuck is going on in Australia. Yeah. And it's just because of the, you know, the media's of a different kind of beast over there, which is great it, for your career. You mm. get a lot of opportunities. Yeah. But it's Aussies are really taking those opportunities now. Yeah, you see, yeah. they're just everywhere. And you probably notice that, um, you know, playing the big festivals yourselves, you're probably seeing more Australian bands on there, running into them at the airports and it must be really encouraging. Like it's changed a lot over the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like the world's big, man. Mm. Um, but... Doing things from an artist's perspective is that what, we t- what we're doing is we're putting the artist first. So we give our agents that book the artists, the gigs that work within the company, the freedom yeah. to kind of take on what, what they want. Yeah. So we kind of have a mutual agreement upon artists that we want to work with. And nice. Like we wish we could take on more, but we... Yeah, of course. Yeah. If yeah. We don't want people to feel lost among the list you know, like we've got forty, totally. got forty-two artists on there at the moment. Yeah, 
which is that's a festival. That's it's a, pretty that's like a few days. I, I was actually <laughs> looking at it yesterday because I went on the website. Nice and um, counted it. I go on there sometimes just to count. Yeah, cool. And there's forty two on there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you must feel uh, I don't know a real sense of accomplishment when you see that. Yeah, like I started the booking agency with Jadden Comerford from Unified and one and of the best Regs as well. Two um, of the best. And at the beginning, I just kind of thought, oh fuck, like let's just take. Let's just book me, just book me. Yeah. And then all these people just like really wanted to come across. Yeah, they came so with we you. we were like, okay, oh, sweet. Now <laughs> yeah. we've got, we got eight. Sick, we have eight. Yeah. And then it was like 15, yeah. whoa, 20, fuck. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 42, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because the game's changed in so many ways as well. How do you find like a healthy relationship with social media? And that being such a big kind mm. of prolific part of it now. Like I speak to a lot of musos and just like, you know what, I feel good for a couple of months, but then, you know, i got to switch off for a couple of months. Don't read your comments. Huh? And not read your comments. Comments, yeah. articles, all that shit. Mm. I fucking read it. i got mm. mates that will literally dissect every single yeah. letter of every single comment. And mm. it does nothing for you because in the past, what I would be doing is you end up kind of like looking for the bad comment. Yeah, totally. It's the one bad egg. The one bad egg. Yeah. I've met f many of fucking bad eggs through this game, right? It happens, right? But you know why it's only been once when it's physically been to my face? You know, it's all been, like, to my face, it's all been love piped on this one time. And I can tell you that that guy left the bar. Like, he, he, was, a, he was a big guy. He would have been, you know, well and truly over six foot. And he fucking left looking like a smurf. Yeah. Because I don't take that shit. Yeah. Sorry. You shouldn't. I won't. I, no. I don't. If I'm I'm gonna be kind and and nice to you. Well, yeah. what happened was we were at I was at a bar with some of my friends, mm. and I was in the line to go to the toilet, and this guy comes up to me and he goes, "Oh, your fuck your touch, Sultana. I, I I really love what you do." And I was like, "Oh, thanks so much, man. I yeah. really appreciate that." And at that time, I'd just come off tour and I was really kind of doubting like me and what I was doing and I was mm. pretty exhausted and I kind of needed a break and I, yeah. any, anyway, I wasn't in a good spot. Yeah. And then he walks off and he turns to his mate and goes, I just saw Tash Sultana and I told them that I love them. But what I really wanted to say is, I think you're a fucking cunt. And I heard it. So I thought, okay, went to the toilet, took a piss, came out, zipped my jeans up. And then, you know, I'm, I'm Maltese, so we got a fiery streak. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out and I said, hey, yeah, 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 you over there with a the ciggy, <laughs> with a leather jacket. Yeah, 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 you, look at me. I heard every single fucking word that you said, by the way. And he just looked at me and was just like. Gutless. Holy shit. And I wasn't looking for, no, you no, know, no. an argument or anything no, like no, that. No, but I thought, you know what? Good on you. Fuck you. And then I knew the people at the bar because it's, it's one of the places that I frequent a lot. And um, I just I told them we were having a laugh about it. And then they stopped serving him and all his friends for the rest of the night. And yeah, they good. could not work out why they were not being served. Good on you for doing that. And they ended up leaving. And it's kind of just like, why bring, why bring that into an environment? It, yeah. It's if you're a famous person or a known person or a public persona person or not, why go up to someone and say something shit when you could just shut the fuck up and not say anything yeah, at all? Absolutely. Like I haven't bothered you in any way, yeah. but that that's the only time that's ever happened. And I've read, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard and read everything under the sun about me as I'm sure, mm. you know, in yeah. your, in your days too. Yeah, that of course. And maybe being a presenter too, it's to out there. To oh, totally. When you're on a global platform. You are going to be judged by the world. Yeah, totally. Because that is, you are in front of the world. So you yeah. cannot expect that you're going to hear what you want to hear all the time. Yeah. But you don't have to fucking tune into the noise. Well said. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's crazy. You, you get that side of it. And then, um, oh, did you press the button? I can, <laughs> you know what I, I did. I, I thought the desk went off. I'm like, does oh, it mute no. everyone? I'm like, oh no, we're on a roll. <laughs> does it mute everyone? No, it's just you. I just no. I, like, I can I'm keep like, it open if I'm you want. Like, here, I'll show you what I was doing. I, I reckon. 
Oh. <laughs> I'm like, um, I'm like, Tash, you need to do this more often, man. You're a pro. You can take my job. I've done a few interviews, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you ready to hear your voice again? You brought up a really good point about touring and how you were doing it nonstop. For those who need some context. I've done the distance around the earth four times and to the moon and back twice. So to come home and sleep in my own bed was really nice. And um, yeah, all my gigs got cancelled, but for me, I just put my head down and wrote a record. I thought that was really cool. I know, I'm sorry about you. <laughs> no, no, you, it's just, voice, you just don't think you sound like that. And <laughs> I've heard so many people say, you know, you. I heard you sing and you had this really beautiful voice, but you just don't talk like that. You don't sound the way when you, you don't sing the way you talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. How important was it just to kind of stop and have a breather and kind of check in with, you know, just get some you time, you know, not being on a tour bus, not playing and just kind of being able to reset. Were you in a more creative mood like I, that? Look, honestly, I actually loved it. I needed it. I'd had enough at that point. There's been a few like really big fast years and then also, yeah. you know, in a sense, I was just growing up in front of the world in a way. Oh, absolutely. Like, not in a, like a fucking Billie Eilish level. No, thing, no, no. no. Oh, was, it was a pretty big level though. But I was really young, you know, like I was straight out of high school and you don't really know who you are. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're going to like 20 21-ish, and then you have this big global hit and everything just goes really fucking fast and yeah. really fucking hard and you're, you're a kid. you Like as much as, you know, you think that you're not, but you, you're very young. Um, It all really did get to me a lot and it it's mm. taken me to kind of go into really dark places to, to come out and develop the boundaries. Um, and, you know, like everything's kind of seasonal. So right now what's working for me is not necessarily what would have worked for me five years ago or in five years. You're just adjusting things as you go. Um, yeah. I like it's kind of like servicing yourself as you go because if you don't, yeah. it's like an old car. If you, you're driving it around, you're revving it around, you're fucking, you're not slowing down over speed bumps. And the car's getting a bit loose and a bit creaky and all of a sudden it overheats and it fucking yeah. catches on fire and then it fucking explodes. Yeah, and totally. You're not even getting any money out of it when you take it to the record wreckers and then mm. no one's going to pay insurance. Yeah. And that's pretty much how it felt at one point was yeah. like this just car that had just fucking exploded and couldn't repair whatsoever. Yeah. So you just kind of almost have to be brand new after that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I'm in a really good spot right now and I'm really grateful for that. And I am accepting of the fact that this could change and, and probably will. But right now where I've landed, I'm really happy. And I think all the roads that led here make sense. And I've been around a little while now and I've pretty much done most things that I want to do. So having what I've got, it's kind of enough for me, um, yeah. whether it be bigger or smaller yeah. or slower or yeah. faster or, you know, I don't really think I can complain. I have all the things that I need. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you're in a really great place. Just, I am just, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and songwriting-wise as well, we're just going to play another snippet of this. I was reading an interview when you're talking about flow state and you're talking about like a track like Free Mind, which is like, it's probably about half the BPM of a song like that. And you were saying there's a lot of room to move like lyrically and to put layers and layers upon things. With a song that's got a bit of a quicker tempo, does it kind of restrict all the bells and whistles you put on it? Like, did it change the way you kind of write a song like this? I mean, I don't think about it like that at all. Yeah, cool. That's great. <laughs> like, you know how I think about it is it's one song that tells one story out of many fucking songs that I've written that tell a different story and many songs that are yet to come that have, again, stories in their own. Yeah. So this next EP that I'm putting out, because it, it is an EP. Cool. So this is just track one. There is six tracks on it. Nice. That sound nothing like James Dean. Yeah. Everything is really different, but it's where I'm at right now as the person that I am right now and as the musician that I am right now in terms of like engineering and yeah, production nice. and arrangement and, you know, just being a little bit older. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But it's also got the essence of like the Notion EP, Flow State album and Terra Firma. So mm. I, I've brought the guitar solos back in. So yes. the other tracks have got those in. Every song nice. pretty much has a solo apart from James Dean and one other one. Okay. Um, yeah, whipped out the sax or, you know, whipped out the guitar. And they're long. 
they're fucking long. Yes. So sit strap yes. in. Yes, you're hearing it here. They're really long. Yes, <laughs> unreal. You've got a band that plays with you live. Do you think about that when you're writing? Um, they're session players. Yep. So everything that you hear on record. Oh, it's all played by you, of course. I play, I, I, yeah, I, but I, a lot of people don't know that. So I'm, I'm going to take a moment to toot my own horn here. How do they um, not know that? Well, I, I actually had someone in an interview ask me <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> who my guitarist is. Oh, you serious? <laughs> <laughs> Thou shall not be named. Uh, I actually don't know their name. Um, but <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, anyway, it's quite funny. But. It's okay, you know, I'm not offended by it. It's just one of those things you laugh at. Yeah, so they're session players and we're all really good mates. Yeah, of course. And they are, we're like family and they are all really fantastic musicians in their own right. Yeah. And everyone is a multi-instrumentalist and does dabbles in all sorts of things, all different nice. genres. Yeah, and, cool. And that, um, we are all different nationalities cool. as well. So it's, we're just like a bit of a motley crew, but. I've loved having them. Um, they provide yeah. an immense amount of support. They're not on stage all the time. Oh, cool. Or too much when they are. It's, yep. It is, a, Tash Sultana is a solo yeah, project. Yeah, of course. So I write everything, record everything, every single thing that you hear on record, all those instruments, all that production, everything that's me. Nice. Unless obviously respective co-writes and collabs. Yeah. Done some work with Matt Corby. I've done some work with Dan Hume, Josh Cashman, yep. Jerome Farrar, Milky Chance. Yeah. I've got I've, all them on my button bar ready to go, but you beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> I know what to do here. Um, and uh, at the moment I've been in America working with kind of in the American hip hop scene. Oh, um, top. Writing with some people. Can you reveal? Do we get any scoops? You can. I, I did a session with Ty Dollar Sign. Oh. We've been talking for a long time. He nice. hit me up a few years ago and it's taken years to finally cross paths. Cool. Anyway, we started a project. And then Leon Thomas is an artist that's signed on Ty Dollar Sign's label who I connected with and cool. really like. Um, and he's also produced for like for Scissor and stuff. Nice. Um BJ, the Chicago kid, I will officially reveal this person is <laughs> on this looking. next record. Don't worry, we won't, we won't publish anything early. You got, you got our blessing. She's literally, <laughs> she's literally, you literally shout yourself. Um, yeah. And then, uh, interestingly, was with Snoop Dogg the other day. Um, we, that's so cool. That is really cool. Yeah. yeah. It was me, um, Snoop Dogg, my wife, a massive blunt, and a bunch <laughs> of strippers. So it's like a Snoop Dogg video clip. <laughs> now, 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 listen. You, in real life. Not, we weren't getting funny with the strippers. They okay. were just literally there. Yeah. Um, and we, I wasn't having any marijuana okay. either. Yeah. But um, th this is a true story. He just said, that he would like to meet me. So we came to the show in Melbourne. Yeah, sick. After the show was done, we came backstage. We're just chilling out. And then his tour manager comes out and goes, okay, Snoop's, Snoop's good. He would like you to come to the dressing room. Um, he would love to meet you. And I was like, okay. Whoa. Um, can I just, <laughs> can I just confirm that you said that Snoop <laughs> would to like yeah, to yeah. meet me? Um, and she's like, yeah, he's ready. So anyway... We walk to the room and then this, ma I'm talking massive security guard yeah. just stopped me. And like, dude, he was huge, this guy. He was like Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> size <laughs> and I'm like five foot two and he stood up and he was just like, this is cool, is this cool for you to go in? <laughs> yeah. And I just took my opportunity out to, I just pulled my sleeve up. And I just showed him my <laughs> muscles like this. And yeah. I said, want an arm wrestle? <laughs> and, and he laughed, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they let me in. Yeah. Um, and Snoop's just like in there, just like dancing and smoking oh, a dude. Oh, that's so cool. And then he gave us a hug and I said, you know, hey, welcome to Australia. I hope everything's treating you well. Oh, and he was so like, cool. yeah, I'm having a good time. What's up, shorty? <laughs> um, yeah. And then, and then the he's just pretty much just said, I've heard a lot about you. Um, and yep. I said, oh, well, thank, thanks very much. And I said, we, 
We have some of the same friends because um, he's good friends with the, some of the people that I was working with over cool. in the States. Yep. And then he goes, well, sounds like we should be getting in the studio together. Oh, that would be so now, cool. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to happen. I've heard no further word. <laughs> People were high as fuck that night, <laughs> but it was said. So would, what happens in the future, I do not know. I would just love to see like him sitting in the corner of the studio with a blunt, listening to one of your guitar solos back I in the don't studio. Even and know if like, he's, I don't even know if he's heard anything, but the following day after that, I really, really famous producer called me. Oh, no way. The, just out of the blue. I'm not going to say the name. Okay. But he's, yeah, he's like one of the most streamed people, producers on the earth. And he was just like, you know, my daughter just got signed to death row. And I'm thinking, what? who'd you get my number off? He was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Snoop, Snoop Dogg's on, on death row. So I'm just like, there's a connection that's happening here. But anyway, oh my God. I've been invited to a few studios. I will go. Wow. I, um... It, yeah, no, I think I, you know, I, I didn't really expect my life to, t- <laughs> to, to turn the way that it's turned into. Um, I just really like to play music. Of so, course, yeah. you know, doing that as a career is amazing. Yeah. Um, and even if it wasn't a career, I would still be playing music. I know you would. You know, yeah, like yeah, that's know just what I do. I love it. It's a need um, that I must satisfy. And, I'm really happy with where I'm at and it's leading me into cool places that yeah. I didn't really expect, but I'm yeah. just going with it and just flowing with it. I love hearing those stories. Do you have like a... I've got so many. Wow. Well. <laughs> we could be here forever. <laughs> Do you have like an ultimate kind of pinch yourself moment that you're looking back on in your career? Like that's obviously got to be like something like that. We're like, oh my God, I'm hanging out with Snoop. Like this is just ridiculous. Has there been another moment like that where you just uh, like, I can't believe this has happened? Y- you know what? It's actually like... They're really little things. And I'll tell you what what it is. Fucking love my Nintendo Switch. And love it. they recently released the Game Boy Advance and Game Boy. Did they? Yeah, you can play those games on the Switch. Oh. And I lost it. Oh. And like, <laughs> I was like, this is so good. And yeah. I was emotional about it. Yeah. That is the type of shit that I will lose <laughs> yeah, yeah. my shit over, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. That. Or playing Pokemon and catching, like, a really rare Pokemon. I love that. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like really, it's, yeah, I can be such a complicated person, but, like, you know, I love when I see that winter is changing into spring and when I'm on my property, all the golden wattle starts to nice. bloom for the first time and I'll go on and on and on about it. Or, yeah. like, my birds of paradise, like, comes out and I'm just like, oh, my God, oh, that's, that's so beautiful. so cool. And my wife's like, shut the fuck <laughs> up. Um, so it's little things like that for me yeah. um, that are like the biggest things for me. Like I've nice. done some really big things, yeah, amazing things, met some cool people. Um, and I'm not really ever starstruck by anyone because I, I was saying this in an interview the other day. It's not the person that b- blows me away. It's the passion. So that could be going to the SB and seeing yeah. some artists that you never fucking heard of before yeah. and they're fantastic and they love what they're doing or it could be Snoop Dogg, yeah. you know, and I will say he loves what he's doing. He was yeah. loving every yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. second of it. Uh, you got time for a quick game? Yeah. Okay, cool. This is what we do with all the acts that come in and just looking through yours, I already know it's going to be fun. So this is... It's called Memory Lane. So what I've done is... <laughs> I've gone through your gig history. Okay. And I'm going to pluck random ones out just to see what you remember. Okay. okay. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be the gig. It could be the drive in. It could be, you know, something as small as that. All right. So we're going to go back to uh, 2014. You played a gig with Timberwolf and the Mighty Pierce Brothers. That was the Night Tree EP launch at the Shabine. You remember that venue in the city? It was like underground. I have a story for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got paid. I thought it was sick because I was just fresh out of high school and that Shabine was like the venue back then, you know. Yeah, totally. And I was the support act and I thought, okay, this is amazing. Like I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm getting I'm on my way. Fuck yeah. Yeah. Anyway, 
And I, re- I opened for them for like a hundred bucks a night and I thought that that was just the wildest shit ever. There were yeah. fuck all people in the room and yeah. whatnot. But, you know, the boys really helped me out at the start. Mm. Um, after the last gig, we all took heaps of mushrooms. Middle of Melbourne CBD on mushrooms. No, not after. in the middle of Melbourne. We <laughs> went back to someone's house okay. and we took mushrooms and jammed all night long. And then the next day I went t- out to kill Kunda and... Pick tapes of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something to remember. See, this is the point of memory lane. You get. Uh, I don't do those things anymore. No, exactly. There was a time and a place. Uh, we're going back to 2016. Now, some of these gigs might not be too accurate, but there was a show with. We got the temper trap, and we got garbage, and we got Adelita from Magic Dirt. <laughs> I see a cheeky grin. A day, yeah, a day in the green story. show. Day I got another green. story for that night. <laughs> and the festival is called A Day on the Green. Yeah, and it literally was a fucking <laughs> night on the green, to be honest, at the end of it. It was a night on the porcelain bus, actually. I was, I don't drink anymore or yep. do anything anymore. I um, live clean. Um, yep. But back then, it was pretty wild. And it's all new and it's exciting. It's, it's new a huge and stage. It's exciting and we're all partying hard. Mm. Anyway, I drank so much Sailor Jerry's that I'm in my room, in my dressing room after I played because it was, you know, playing a day on the green, this big- Two o'clock? Three o'clock. Huge, like, this is huge when you're starting out. Anyway, got my head in the fucking bin. I'm vomiting. <laughs> oh, like, no. no. tomorrow. And Gidinski walks yeah. in. That's the first time we met. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm going to like you. <laughs> That's the first time we met. Yeah. Uh, what was it like playing a big show like that, you know, first time around as an experience? Um, that I think that was ki- that was kind of around when I started doing your, like, grooving the moves and your lane ways and a mm. day on the green. And that and yeah. at that period of time, I was not home ever. Yeah. I was never, ever home. I was always away. Mm. So I remember being very tired. And so hungover. Mm, like, yeah, like the whole period. time. <laughs> yeah, the whole time. <laughs> well, you kind of remember my memory. Uh, a year later, you did St. Jerome's. And looking back, it's a killer lineup. Like we got Tame. We got Gangs. And just just so many more. That, that's a really fun festival, right? And, yeah, yeah. And I feel like all those bands like you, Gangs and Tame, were all kind of on the same level. You were just, you know, you're really kind of taking off at once. It's really special. Um, that was actually the first time that I met um, Gang of Youth properly. And we're, we've been good friends since then. Yeah, but cool. I met them for the very first time in Singapore. And I think Dave and I just took like a bit of a shining yeah. to one another. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. Yeah. They all are really lovely. And they are a fantastic band. It's yeah. been so good to watch them. I mean, I feel like they were always meant to play arenas, but when, I mean, we saw, Jules and I went and saw them last time they were in Melbourne and it's just an arena show. I feel like Dave is just meant for those moments, right? He knows what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go overseas. Uh, the Rock Wurcher. I've got so many fucking stories. All right, well... <laughs> I really got to learn how to pronounce these things before I say them. So we've got Jimmy World, Lincoln Park. And uh, we have Blink. Now, are you getting time to see these other bands when you're on? Are you pretty much in and out? No, it was actually my parents came to that leg of the tour because it was the first time I'd gone and done an international bus tour. So they came oh, cool. um, at the very beginning of it, mm. my parents and my sibling. Yep. Um... And I was in such a sh- in such shit shape, in such a fucking bad place, like that tour at the end ended up actually being cancelled, and I went home. Yeah, um, okay. And I did five weeks of uh, therapy, pretty much. Yeah. I needed to be emotionally rehabilitated at that point. Yeah. I've spoken about it before. Mm. Pivotal time in my life. One of those ones where it's kind of like a do or die, make or break. Yeah. Um, it was definitely necessary. But that, yeah, that that's, I was, I really wanted to get up and watch Blink-182, but I'd fallen asleep after my set in okay. the bunk. Yeah. And no one woke me up. Okay. Because... They wanted me to sleep. To rest. To rest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for those who kind of have an understanding of Australian tours, you know that it's mostly just weekends, but you're right. When you're doing those shows, it's it's every night, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. and it's just 
just you performing as well. And you, like you said, you're a multi-instrumentalist, there's so much energy. Like it's, it really takes a lot out of you, these shows, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like back then I wasn't even fucking barely showering or wearing shoes. Yeah. So, you know, now I get, you know, two or three showers in the day and mm. put, put the shoes on <laughs> because I was just a mess. Um, I didn't, yeah, I even, like, I looked back at that and it was like, I just didn't care. I yeah. didn't care. I didn't care about how I looked. I didn't yeah. care about how I came across. I didn't care. Yeah. Well, Still let, don't, but, like, I brush my hair now. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go two years later. You did a US tour with these guys. We've done a festival with these guys. They are... Like having fun. Uh, of course, I'm <laughs> talking to Ocean Alley. <laughs> Speaking of getting loose. Uh, and looking at some of these venues, you know, these are like 4,000 capacity. Like, what was it kind of like, you know, you're getting big here, but watching it kind of explode overseas. It must have felt so cool. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, they lo- they do enjoy having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of it. Yeah, big time. Um, OA, oh, Ocean Alley, they are also um, an artist on my agency, yeah. uh, Lonely Lands Agency. But, you know, they how it came about with them is I was introduced to their music in 2016 yep. by my mate Josh Cashman. And I really loved the band. And they were kind of like a bit of an underground Sydney thing back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I thought, you know what, I, I love these guys and I just asked them to be the opener for shows that I had coming up in 2017 and then mm. it just kind of went from there and, and they've done, you know, respectfully yeah. all the things that they've done. I think like what's cool about watching your career is you're right, you're giving all these kind of Australian bands a platform. Yeah, overseas. but they pay it forward. So, you know, OA, like they got to where, yeah, they did open for me, but where they've gotten is not because of that. It's because yeah. of what they have done of and course. how the music affects people. You know, that's, they've gotten where they've gotten mm. because of themselves. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But they pay that, you know, they've paid that forward with other people. Yeah, exactly. Opening. Yeah. It's the same with like Lime Cordial. Mm. They used to open for me too. Yeah. Now they're doing what they do. Yeah, absolutely. I used to open for the Pierce Brothers. Yeah. And now they open for me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's And been... <laughs> they always joke about it. It's like, you know, we got you cheap. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's been my band's kind of thing. Every band we've supported has like blown up and we've kind of stayed at like this mediocre level. It's funny how it all works. But have you opened for some fucking wankers though? Yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Gosh. In the early days. We will not say names. No, we won't. It's n- it's not... Not, n- nah, we don't do that, but no. fuck me. Yeah. We'll keep the cough button down for yeah. a, a, a long amount of time for that. Uh, I know we're running short on time, but there is one gig I, I really want to talk about because I remember saw, seeing footage from it. So special. Red Rocks. 10,000 people. You broke a record, sold out in five minutes. That is 33 tickets a second. Where were you? Like, uh, you know, like the thrill is in announcing a gig and the excitement and then... Where were you when you got the call? The, um, the... I think I was just in bed. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I think I was in bed. Um, I've played Red Rocks three times. Um, mm. I opened for John Butler for one of them. Nice. He's uh, such a legend. Yeah, he is a legend. Mm. Uh, the second time I also sold that out. Not not like yeah. the last time. It, I think it's kind of hard to see how, how people's global careers are in Australia because you're kind of only seeing their Australian presence. Yeah. But like, you know, um, when I go overseas, I'm gratefully and, and thankfully doing like those type of numbers. Yeah. Um, with really not a lot of like airplay yeah. as well. Like yeah. they're not smashing me on radio over there or really playing me at all. Um, I don't really do lots of promo yeah. or anything like that. So, again, it is really this kind of still on this scale. It's a somewhat yeah. word of mouth underground yeah. kind of go because before people actually hear the song, they actually w- have already seen it. Yeah. Like they've visually seen it yeah. on YouTube or a video somewhere generally before they've heard it on radio. Uh, i got one more game. On Triple M's Homegrown with Matteo, it's time for... Uh-oh! 
It's my party or dinner. Now, this is right party dinner. We've got Jules on the backing vocals out there. Um, so, essentially, we might have to go back to the Tash Sultana partying day. So, it's called right party dinner. I'm going to give you three acts. You can write a song with them. You can party with them. Or you can take them home to dinner. Your three acts are. All of us. Can I do every, you know Eric, what? Eric could do. No, no, you're going to hear the others. I'm in love with the shape of you. Like a shampoo, like a magnet. We got Ed. And then we got. Right party dinner, Erica Badu, one of your favourites, Ed Sheeran, Elton John. Okay, um, Erica Badu, I would really want to be doing the full spectrum. Um, okay. I feel like we could write something really great oh, together. Absolutely. Um, Ed Sheeran, I would go and party with. Yeah, that'd be fun. I thought he was hanging out with Snoop in Melbourne. I he thought you might have caught him. Yeah, he was there the day before oh, okay. me. Um, so that yeah. could have been... Interesting. <laughs> if I came the day before, but I didn't. And we're having dinner with Elton. And yeah, having dinner with Elton because I think I've got some questions that I would like to ask. Yeah, you know. awesome. Tash Sultana, this has been an absolute pleasure for me for the show. We've been chatting for nearly an hour. Uh, it's been so much fun. Thank you. Pleasure to catch up with you again. It's been really awesome. Thank you.